So welcome everybody to our third lecture of our online lecture series, International Perspectives on the Study of Racism, Definitions, Concepts, Measures with Shahad Goel. My name is Gian Sinanulu. I'm the head of the Office of the National Monitoring of Discrimination and Racism at the Dezim Institute. We are extremely honored and pleased to have Shahad Goel with us today. Before I head over to Niklas Hader, who will introduce um, Shahad Goel and moderate the discussion, I want to say a couple of words about the aim and the content of the lecture series. The term and the concept of racism has only recently been fully acknowledged in German society. While talk of racism has been common in radical movements of the past two decades, it was largely avoided in academia and mainstream politics. A series of violent, racist and anti-Semitic attacks in the cities of Halle and Hanau and ultimately the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement in Germany after the killing of George Floyd in the US brought about a radical shift. In light of these events and under the pressure of the civil society, the federal government had asked the Dezim Institute, among others, to shed light on the, on, um, on the scale of racism in Germany from the scientific point of view. Our task is to provide data about the causes, extent and consequences of racism in our society. The task, however, presents a dilemma. As much as our societies and moreover, the communities who suffer from racism, racism urgently need scientific evidence, the positivistic notion that one could measure racism seems to be contested. Against this backdrop, we want to discuss with internationally renowned scholars some of the complications and complexities in the study of racism. Therefore, the lecture series is intended to invite international scientists to comprehend racism in a complex manner in its individual, institutional, structural and social dimension in order to shed light on racism from a global perspective and the particular challenge for Germany. This talk today will be moderated by Niklas Hader and me. So just briefly to Niklas Hader. Dr. Niklas Hader is a social psychologist and had been working at the, um, 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 okay, no, I'm sorry, I, um, I was wrong here with, uh, with the Dr. Niklas Hader, just um, I was on the wrong, um, so Dr. Niklas Hader is a postdoctoral researcher at the Dezim Institute and an associate member of the Immigration Policy Lab at Stanford University. His research focuses on integration and political participation. He also works on the evaluation of integration policies in Europe and uh, North America. And to this end, he applies current methods of casual inference to um, survey data as well as process generated and administrative data. So Niklas Sada is the co-chair of the section um, of integration at the Dezim Institute. And now I hand over to Niklas. Thank you, Jihan, and good evening, everybody. I am extremely honored and happy to introduce uh, Sharad Goyal today. Uh, Sharad Goyal is, recently took a position as a professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Congratulations again. He is also the co-director of the Stanford Computational Policy Lab. Uh, he was trained as a mathematician and computer scientist. However, his research has proven to be extremely relevant for the social sciences and public policy. Today, he will be talking about how to measure racism and, bi and uh, apply this to biased policing. But he has also published on fairness in machine learning, voter fraud, or political polarization, amongst other issues. It's nearly impossible to uh, name all outlets that he has published in. I will just name a few. Um, his research was published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, in Nature, Human Behavior, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in Science Advances, and the American Political Science Review. We are excited to hear uh, from uh, Sharad Goyle how to measure racism empirically and uh, learn about his large scale analysis of racial disparities in police stops across the United States. Thank you for being with us here today, Sharad, and um, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and and thanks everyone for for organizing this. And oh, you. excuse me, I, I missed one extremely important point. Um, questions. Um, everybody can ask questions through the chat on YouTube or by sending an email to Veranstaltung at institutede If you have clarification questions during the talk, please also use these venues to contact us. Um, Excuse me for this uh, little uh, error. And now, Sharaj, finally, floor yeah. yours. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to keep the presentation relatively informal. So feel free to ask questions throughout, and, and we'll have a chance to have a discussion at the end as well. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, um, so today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our work on trying to understand what does it even mean to, to, to talk about discrimination or, or bias, how we can uncover it empirically, and then ways we might be able to combat it, specifically in the context of, of policing, and this will specifically be in the U.S. context, but I think the ideas are much more general. They, they apply internationally and also in domains beyond, beyond policing. Um, so most of the, the work that I'm going to talk about is, is coming out of what we call the Stanford Open Policing Project. So this was an effort that we started about seven years ago or so when I first got to Stanford. Um, and at the time, we were interested in, in understanding discrimination in policing, but realized that there are relatively few public resources, um, re relatively little public data on policing interactions. And so we started collecting it. And perhaps naively, I thought, you know, this would take us a year or two to get the relevant data. And now, seven years in, we're still going. And to date, we've we've collected over 200 million records of individual stop um, uh, stops, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And so we've um, we've collected data from you know something like 30 states and, and 50 cities all across the, the United States. So the first way I'm going to talk about discrimination is this notion of blinding, and, and this is going to be in the context of stop decisions. So the first kind of empirical fact that's, that's useful to know is, um, and has been kind of widely stated, is that black drivers in the United States are, are stopped more often than white drivers relative to their share of the driving age population. But differences in stop rates in and of themselves, they don't tell us much about discrimination or racial profiling in that we don't know that those rates themselves don't tell us about differences in driving behavior, like time spent on the road or adherence to traffic laws. So it could be, for example, you know, again, hypothetically, that, that black drivers are spending more time driving um, or, or black drivers are not adhering to traffic laws at the same rates. And so that could be accounting for the differences in, in the uh, relative stop rates between the race groups. And so this is kind of the first fundamental problem that we want to we want to address empirically is how can we um, see whether or not it's it's one's race, the color of one's skin, which is leading to these elevated um, stop rates. And so there's this very clever idea that was that was introduced in, in 2006 by Gregor and Ridgway that has come to be known as the Veil of Darkness test. And the idea, it's, it's, it's simple, um, but a kind of a, a very clever insight. And so the idea is that it's harder to infer the race of a driver at night when a veil of darkness, so-called veil of darkness, masks one's race. And so what is the implication of this? It means that if black drivers comprise a smaller fraction of those who are stopped at night than those who are stopped during the day, it suggests that officers may be discriminating against black drivers. Why is that? Because again, remember, if you can't see someone's race at night, then maybe you would think that, oh, well now, because officers can't tell who is driving the car, you'd expect if there is this type of racial profiling, that officers couldn't tell who's driving the car, and so they're, they're likely to, to stop fewer black drivers at night. And so the, again, this is kind of a clever idea. Um, the first time I heard about it, I was like, oh, you know, I wonder, is this really true? And, and so I went out on the street and I actually stopped and I, and I tried to detect whether or not you could see someone's race at night, whether you could see their race during the day. In fact, you can, it's like a pretty prominent um, effect. Not perfect, um, but you can actually, this veil of darkness, it does seem to be 
um, a, a real phenomenon, and that's what we're using to kind of empirically test whether or not officers are responding to um, uh, the perceived race of a driver when making these types of steps. Um, but now, again, a moment to thought here says, okay, well, night and day, these are the other things are changing at the same time. And so driving patterns might change by, by time of day. And so really, the real kind of clever insight of, of this approach is that we can use the fact that the sun sets at different times throughout the year. So for example, 7 p.m. is dark in the winter, but light in the summer. And so now you can say at exactly the same time, the wall clock time, Sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's dark, sometimes it's light, and so now we can still look at to see whether or not um, we see differences in stop behavior uh, adjusting for both the time of day and the amount of light um, that that is available. Um, and also, this I'm just using this for intuition, but really, when we execute this test, we um, uh, go one step further and use changes in daylight savings. And so now we're not even talking about winter versus summer, but we're just talking about a couple weeks difference. And now all of a sudden, on when daylight savings changes, all of a sudden, the exact same time on one side of it, it's dark. On the other side of it, it's light. So now we've really kept almost everything the exact same other than the amount of light outside to, to see one's race. But here for simplicity, I'm just going to talk in terms of, of seasonal, seasonal changes. So here to give you um, a sense, I'm gonna pull out one specific location. So this is Texas, a large state in the, in the United States. And here, this is showing us the raw data for one, um, uh, a specific 15 minute block of time, 7.15 to 7.30 p.m. And here, what we see here is the is minute sense dark. And so here, each of these are kind of different buckets of minute sense dark. And so over here, it's, it's, it's dark, here it's light. And we see this quite noticeable drop in the fraction of stop drivers who are black that varies across this darkness. So again, the punchline here is when it's dark outside, and we see this very kind of sudden drop when it's when it's dark outside, we see a sudden drop um, when officers can't easily tell the race of who's driving, we see a smaller fraction of stop drivers who are black. Here I'm just showing you for one 15 minute bucket, 7.15 to 7.30, we can do this again for seven to 7.15, 7.30 to 7.45, and we see this exact same pattern. So this quite kind of sharp drop um, in the proportion of stop drivers who are black as a function of, of time sense uh, darkness. So again, this, you know, in, in aggregate across our entire data set, we see that the share of stop drivers who are black is considerably smaller after dusk than before sunset. And this pattern suggests that officer stop decisions are based in part on the color of one's skin. Okay, so now before before moving on to the next, um, uh, the next section, I just wanna briefly uh, stop to see if there are any, any questions on, on, on this type of analysis. Just wait a uh, couple seconds to see if people want to chime in. So, so far, I see no questions. Okay, great. Um, so, so again, feel really feel free to to jump at any point. And I, um, I'm hoping this can be a, a conversation. So now let's um, uh, let's talk about an alternative approach to to gauging bias discrimination. In, in policing interactions. And here, I wanna switch context, not from that initial stop decision, but to vehicle searches. And so when officers um, uh, uh, stop a driver, uh, for example, for a traffic stop, for, uh, for an alleged speeding violation, for example, they have legal discretion to conduct a search of that vehicle for contraband, typically drugs, if they believe, if they have um, what's called probable cause for, for conducting a search of that vehicle, if they have reason to believe that there is, is this, is this uh, contraband in the vehicle. And so the key question here is, do officers hold all drivers to that same probable cause standard, irrespective of race? when they're carrying out this uh, search decision, when they make this search decision. Okay, so it's a little bit different than this first example of, of deciding whom to stop, but again, it's, it's a, a type of analysis I wanna present here that's common in many of these types of, of interactions, even beyond policing. 
So again, the, the simplest thing one might try to do in testing for discrimination in this interaction is asking whether or not white and black drivers are searched at similar rates. And as we saw in the stop decision, a higher search rate for black drivers might indicate a lower and discriminatory bar for searching them. You know, let's say then when, when black drivers are stopped, they're searched 50% of the time, but when dry, white drivers are stopped, they're only searched 10% of the time. You might say, well, one plausible explanation for that is that black drivers are being discriminated against in this particular search uh, decision, and they're being searched on the basis of less evidence. But likewise, as we saw in the stop decision, without more information, it could also be the case that black and um, white drivers are being held to the same standard, but that black drivers are more likely to be above that search threshold for, for whatever reason, you know, for, you know, ways that they might be interacting with officers or their, their uh, uh, likelihood that, that drivers are, are carrying contraband. That might actually be what's what is driving these differences in search behavior, um, not discrimination per se. And so this again is what we want to disentangle the same way we're trying to disentangle these two possibilities in the uh, stop decision. Okay, so how do we do this? So again, there's this very kind of simple but clever insight that, that Gary Becker, um, the, the Nobel laureate in, in economics, um, made in addressing this problem. And so he said, well, it's very hard to look at search rates and ask whether or not um, the differences in search rates are due to discrimination. And so instead he said, let's turn the problem on its head, not let's not look at search rates, but let's look at search outcomes. And so what is the value of looking at search outcomes? So first of all, what is a search outcome here? This means that we're asking how often are searches of white and black drivers successful, meaning how often do you actually find contraband when these searches are conducted? And so this is what we call the hit rate, the search success rate. We also call that the hit rate. And so the idea is a lower hit rate for black drivers could mean that black drivers are being searched on the basis of less evidence. So why is that? Let me give you an extreme hypothetical. So let's say that when um, uh, white drivers are searched, contraband is found in them about 90% of the time. But when black drivers are searched, contraband is found in them only 10% of the time. So if that were true, and again, this is a hypothetical, we'll look at the real data in a minute. If that were true, then that suggests that black drivers are being searched on the width of evidence because only 10% of the time in this, in this stylized example, do you actually see contraband? That suggests that officers are kind of conducting these searches just on the width of evidence, but white drivers in contrast, because contraband is found on them 90% of the time when a search is conducted, suggest that officers are only conducting those searches when they're really quite certain that they're going to find contraband, okay? So this difference in hit rate is suggestive of, of discrimination. So now, Let's again, so what I would argue here is that while this is a, a kind of quite intuitive way of, of um, uh, inferring potential discrimination in, in decision making, it actually su suffers from a subtle statistical um, flaw, which I'm going to try to outline now. Um, and, and then we're going to develop a, a fix or a, at least a, a way to mitigate that statistical shortcoming that we're going to apply to the data. Okay, so let's try to understand what can go wrong in this, in this intuitive uh, test for discrimination. So let's think about this from the perspective of an officer. And again, they're asking, what is the chance that there's contraband in the vehicle? So they might see this car, this family of four, and then, okay, this is a low chance of, of, of having contraband. Um, now they see this single driver, um, maybe distract a little bit and say, okay, maybe a little bit higher chance of finding contraband. They see this older couple driving a car, um, again, maybe a low chance of finding contraband. So now they um, uh, they see this uh, kind of the, the VW bus, kind of a, a, a stereotypical um, image in, in, in the US of people um, who might be engaged in, in uh, illicit contraband use. And we have uh, maybe, okay, a little bit higher than um, uh, average use of chance of finding contraband in the vehicle. And now we have this guy who's like clearly intoxicated and almost certainly keeping contraband in the vehicle. So we have 
you know, the, the officers might be laying these individuals out on this probability spectrum. Say here, we have these low, low chance of finding contraband on the left-hand side and high chance of finding contraband on the right-hand side based on all the available information. So we can think of this as providing some distribution, some probability distribution of contraband that an officer is observing. Again, most people are on this low end of the spectrum. Some people are on this higher end of, of the spectrum. And we can abstract all of this away, and we have this risk distribution, where the risk is over individuals in the population. Okay, so again, some people have low chance of carrying contraband, some people have high chance of carrying contraband from an officer's perspective based on the available information. So this is a little bit of a complicated object. It's a distribution overestimated risk. But now, if we have two different populations, so let's say one population corresponds to white drivers, another population corresponds to black drivers. We have two different risk distributions. Again, these distributions aren't inherent to um, one's race, but reflect perhaps differences in socioeconomics, perhaps reflect all sorts of complex differences that lead to differences in risk distributions that an officer is observing. And here what I showed in this picture is risk distributions that, that have different means. Now we can also look at risk distributions that have the same, that are centered at the same point, meaning that people in these different groups have the same overall chance of having contraband, but the shape of the distribution differs across groups. And when the shape of the distribution differs across groups, then it's harder in one group to find contraband than in the other. And this is the key fact that we're gonna be using to understand the limitations of this, of this Becker style outcome test. Okay, now again, just in a couple more slides to try to understand what can go wrong here. So we'll, we'll consider this problem where we have two groups, the red group and the blue group. They're both carrying contraband. They both on average have contraband 30% of the time. And now we're gonna have a um, we're going to assume that there is this facially neutral police search policy that says let's search everybody that has a greater than a 50% chance, as the officer estimates it to be, chance of carrying contraband. Okay, so an officer is searching all of these people over here on the right of the dashed line and is not searching these people on the left of the dashed line. So what's going to happen under this search policy? Well, in this case, when blue drivers are searched, officers are going to find contraband more often than when red drivers are searched. They're going to find contraband on blue drivers 60% of the time, even though they only find contraband on red drivers 55% of the time. And so the outcome test is going to say, oh, officers are discriminating against red drivers because they're less likely to find contraband when they search them. Even though, as I've shown this picture, uh, all drivers, both the red drivers and blue drivers, are subjected to the same race-neutral search threshold of 50%. So what's going on here is that the blue drivers, uh, the blue group, has more people who are very likely to be carrying contraband, and so this increases that hit rate, that search success rate. It can throw off the outcome test. And so our idea of discrimination here is holding people to the same standard, which is indicated by this dashed um, vertical line. But our measurement for that, this outcome test, is looking not only at that search standard, but is also um, affected by this distribution of risk in the tail. Okay, so this is the subtlety that we have to deal with. Now, relatedly, we could have a hypothetical scenario where officers are applying a discriminatory double standard. So in this picture, officers are searching blue drivers on less evidence, on 45% chance of finding contraband than red drivers, who they're only searching with if they think there's a 50% chance of, of finding contraband. But in this case, the hit rates are equal. So if you look at the chance of finding contraband um, among searched blue and red drivers, then you're going to find contraband about 55% in each group, even though there's this discriminatory double standard. So the outcome test is telling us there's no discrimination, but based on this picture, we actually do see there's discrimination against the blue group because there's this double standard. Okay. So this is what's called the problem of, of inframarginality. It's an idea that's been floating around for um, quite some time in the economics literature. 
Although empirically, there hasn't been as much, um, uh, this, this hasn't been a phenomenon that's, that's been identified in the data. And so that's what I want to talk about now. And so again, what is this idea of inframarginality? It means that, that the thing that we care about really depends on what's happening at that margin, whether or not there's a double standard. But these inframarginal statistics, like the hit rate, depend not only on what's going on at the margin, but also on the full distribution of risk. And so these types of inframarginal statistics are imperfect proxies for, um, uh, for that threshold and hence are problematic measures of, of discrimination. Okay, so now what are we going to do here? Um, well, we introduced what, what we call the threshold test. And so this is a hybrid approach that we use to um, uh, try to infer that threshold of, of conducting a search directly by simultaneously estimating both the threshold and the distribution of risk. So that turns out to be a, a statistically difficult problem and one that's actually not perfectly well defined um, unless we make some added structural assumptions about how this distribution of risk um, varies across population and across locations. But in a nutshell, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I just wanna give you a little bit of intuition. In, in a nutshell, what we're doing is we look at all of the data that we have across jurisdictions, across race groups, and we try to reconstruct the thresholds and risk distributions that are simultaneously consistent for all of these observations of hit rates and search rates across race groups and across, um, across jurisdictions. So now um, uh, let's just look at, at what happens when we apply this approach. And I wanna start by looking at 5 million traffic stops in, in North Carolina. So let's start by looking at the standard Bucker style hit rate. The, um, again, this outcome test that, that, uh, that I think is, is a powerful, even though is a subtly flawed test for discrimination. And here, what I'm plotting here, each point is a, is a jurisdiction, is one of these um, 100 largest cities in North Carolina in their size by the number of stops in each of these locations. And on the axis here is the white hit rate in that location, um, the search success rate in that location, and then the minority hit rate on the vertical axis broken out by black drivers and Hispanic drivers. So let's first look at this panel of Hispanic drivers. And so what we see here is in that almost all of these locations, the hit rate, the search success rate for Hispanic drivers is lower than the hit rate for white drivers. And so again, by the Becker style argument, that suggests that there is bias against um, Hispanic drivers in almost all of these locations in North Carolina, almost all of these cities in North Carolina. But now when we look at black drivers, we see a very different pattern. In almost all of these locations, um, the hit rate for black drivers for white drivers is about the same. They almost all lie in the diagonal. So again, by this Becker style argument, we would conclude that there's not discrimination against black drivers in this search decision. So this is where we start in the analysis and we're actually quite surprised by, by this. It's, it seemed unusual to us that there would be you know, relatively clear evidence by this test of discrimination against one, one um, uh, ethnic group, Hispanic drivers, but not against another, black drivers. And so this is what led us down that rabbit hole of trying to understand what might be going on. And that's where we came to this um, this idea of the threshold test and, and, and kind of rediscover this notion of, of inframarginality that's been floating around in the economics literature. Um, so now, kind of backing up and or going forward here and applying our, our uh, threshold test, what do we see? And now I'm plotting not the hit rates, but these inferred thresholds in each of these locations for both black drivers and Hispanic drivers. And now we see that the pattern is quite different. We see that in almost all of these locations for uh, both of these groups, um, the, the inferred search threshold for minority drivers is substantially lower than the inferred search threshold for white drivers. And so again, this is indicative of a double standard of what we would call discriminatory behavior in these search decisions. So a very different um, finding from when we look just at those hit rates from when we try to look at these um, search standards directly. So what's going on here? So this again is a kind of uh, uh, 
you know, it, a substantially different result when we switch over to the to trying to infer the the threshold versus just looking at the hit rates. And so let's kind of dive deeper into this um, finding uh, by looking at Raleigh, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, a large city in, in in North Carolina, where the hit rate for black drivers is sixteen percent. And the hit rate for white drivers is is 13%. So not only do we see kind of, you know, many, as in many cities in North Carolina, we see comparable hit rates. And in Raleigh, we actually see a lower hit rate for um, for white drivers and black drivers, meaning by this Becker style argument, um, uh, the, the outcome test would suggest bias against white drivers. So not only an absence of bias, but actually bias against white drivers in this particular search decision. So an even more surprising um, phenomenon. You might say that, okay, well, you know, maybe there's maybe there are areas where there's kind of no discrimination, where where black and white drivers are treated comparably, but now we're seeing it even more extreme, where it looks like there's discrimination against white drivers, which is a, a surprising phenomenon if true. And so let's see what's really going on in, in, in North Carolina, in, in Raleigh. So this is a, a picture of our inferred distributions. Um, uh, that's these red and, and, and black lines, and along with the inferred thresholds for black drivers and, um, and white drivers. And what we see here is two, two facts. First, the threshold for black drivers for this search, uh, for this search decision is lower than for white drivers. So despite this higher hit rate, we see a lower search threshold, meaning discrimination against black drivers. Um, and we also see this higher risk in the tail of, of carrying contraband for black drivers. And so this higher estimated risk for black drivers is what's driving up the hit rate. And so this seems to be kind of this idea of inframarginality playing out in the data. So even though we have this lower search threshold, it's being offset by this higher risk distribute this higher tail risk, which is driving up the hit rates. And so we would say there's a discriminatory double standard discriminating against black drivers. And the outcome test, the hit rate, is um, is is giving us a skewed picture of that because of this difference in in distribution and um, in in the risk distribution itself. Okay, so now what might be driving this this difference in risk distribution, and how do we even know that this is something that we can trust? Um, well, we don't know for sure. Um, this is kind of doing this sort of a fairly difficult statistical inference where you know we we don't get to directly observe the risk distribution. We don't get to directly observe um, uh, the search threshold, and so we have to infer it from. Or inferred from all the data that we have. But one kind of um, uh, corroborating piece of evidence is that in Raleigh, the officers are recording whether or not they conduct their search on what's called plain view evidence of contraband. So this suggests that they, this is this is what officers write down when they believe they see that contraband in plain view. So they might see drug paraphernalia or something like that in plain view. Um, and what's going on in Raleigh is that officers are marking this down three times more likely, three times more often for, for black drivers and for white drivers, which suggests that these risk distributions would have a heavier tail for black drivers than for white drivers. So again, we don't know for sure um, uh, what's going on. We don't know for sure that that we that we actually had that we actually have this heavier risk um, risk distribution, but at least this is one piece of evidence that is suggestive that 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 phenomenon, um, and uh, and and helps corroborate this or helps reconcile this lower search standard with this um, higher higher hit rate. Okay, so now again, I want to just pause for. Uh, a minute here to see if there are any any quick questions on on this material that we just covered before um, going to the last section of, of, of the talk. Um, so far, no clarification questions. We have a few questions about effect heterogeneity and so forth, but I think these are great questions for the discussion. Okay, great. So um, let's kind of continue to this last part of, of the talk now, and then we'll open it up to a to a broader um, discussion. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about disparate impact, which is another notion of, of discrimination, which in many ways I think is is the one that that is, is that in many contexts is is arguably the one that is really driving 
uh, much of the disparities that I think we need to care about, especially in policing, but is also one that is received relatively little attention in, in the research community, in the academic um, literature. And so what is the idea here? The idea here is that policies and practices could have an impact, a disproportionate impact, a negative impact on racial minorities um, even in the absence of animus or any kind of intentional uh, 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 way of, of discrimination, we could still see quite negative impacts. And, and so now the question is, well, how do we see this play out in various contexts and how might we be able to combat this and how might we be able to detect it? So there are a couple different ways that I want to talk about this phenomenon. Um, and in the first is, is in terms of cost benefit analysis in, in Nashville, a large US city. And so here again, the idea is, can we estimate both the costs and the benefits of a particular policing practice and uh, in terms of, of the public safety benefits and the cost to racial minorities? So I'm gonna play this out in an analysis that we recently did in, in Nashville. So in 2011 to 2017, the Metropolitan National Police Department conducted um, up to 10 times as many traffic stops per capita when compared to similar American cities. And so this was a quite large um, you know, difference. There's a lot of traffic stops that are that are happening in Nashville and uh, black drivers, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, given everything else that we know um, and, and what we've seen seen so far in the talk, is that black drivers were, substa were stopped substantially more often than white drivers, uh, particularly for non-moving violations. And so these are are, are stops, for example, for for broken taillights, for things that are, don't obviously have a, a traffic benefit. And um, in particular, in 2017, the per, the per capita stop rate for non-moving violations for black drivers was about 70% higher than, um, than for, for white drivers. And so the theorized benefit from an MNPD, from the, from the National Metropolitan uh, Police Department, was that these stops were, were uh, justified um, due to their purported crime-fighting benefits. And so the idea was that when officers carry out these types of stops, especially for non-moving violations, that that would be a, a way to curb, for example, uh, burglary into these more serious types of, of crime. And so in particular, these types of non-moving violation stops were concentrated in high crime neighborhood, which in Nashville, as in many parts of the United States, often were disproportionately, had disproportionate um, black populations. And so we sought to answer whether or not this, this um, purported benefit was actually apparent in the historical data from 2011 to 2017. And so I'm just going to show you one kind of very quick analysis here um, just to, to kind of give you the intuition, but more, more detail is, is available in our, in our report. So here, um, this uh, one way that we, that we approach this problem as, as we looked at the number of non-moving violation stops that were occurring over time, and we see here that there was a significant drop uh, in, in the number of, of non-moving violations that were stopping, that they're happening over time. And in particular, from 2017 relative to uh, 2012, there's almost a 50% a, uh, reduction in the number of stops that were, the per capita stops that were happening over time. But at the same time, the number of, of serious crimes, what are known as part one crimes per capita, was basically uh, constant. And so we see even though there's a significant drop in the number of, of uh, stops that were happening over time, uh, the, the actual number of crimes were about the same. And if we look at violent crimes, we likewise see almost the exact same, you know, very steady um, uh, 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 per, uh, is very, very steady incident rate of both violent crimes and serious crimes, part one crimes, even though we see this quite dramatic drop in, in stops. And so the idea here is that, you know, the takeaway, and again, this is a very kind of crude analysis, but I want to use this as, a, as intuition for this type of cost benefit analysis, is that um, uh, this shows that there is, uh, there is no clear crime fighting benefit for conducting non-moving violation stops, even though there is quite significant disparate impacts on the community, particularly on black drivers. So as a result, we argued that the city should significantly limit the use of such stops 
which in turn would um, we argue would reduce the impact of these of the observed disparities without having a negative impact on um, uh, 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 on public safety. And so in response to this type of analysis and, and likewise in response to public pressure, the MNPD, the Metropolitan National Police Department, in fact, reduced the use of traffic stops by about 75% and did not see any rise in crime. And so here we see by doing this cost benefit analysis, when there is very little benefit, public safety benefit, again, remember this was the purported theory for for carrying out this, these types of stops when there's relatively little benefit and there's a clear cost in terms of the disproportionate burdens that uh, black drivers are facing, um, you know, curbing that uh, that tactic can lead to um, uh, uh, can ameliorate the the costs while um, not having any negative impact on on public safety. So now I want to finish with one more example of of uh, a disparate impact analysis in New York City. And so here, the context is, is what's called stop and frisk. So this is a controversial policing tactic that's used in many large American cities where officers can stop people on the police when they have what's called a reasonable suspicion of, of criminal activity. And in New York City, the um, department was conducting millions of stops as part of its stop and frisk program, peaking in 2011. So as in Nashville, this policy was associated with large racial disparities, both for Black and Hispanic residents. And so this is one of the reasons why this, this policy really um, uh, was getting a lot of public attention, because there was a, a, a kind of feeling that, that this, the tactic was, was disproportionately content, uh, concentrated in minority neighborhoods and did not have much clear benefit on, on public safety. And so now, instead of looking at the overall public safety uh, benefits of, of the policy, which very much looked like Nashville, where there was likewise a significant drop in, in stops over time without an increase in crime, I want to switch to a different type of analysis. And so this is what we look at, you know, in, in the, this is this is a type of analysis that we that where we look at comparable contexts. So we're looking at at individuals of different race groups, different ethnic groups, in comparable contexts, and see if they experience um, uh, similar behavior from the officer's perspective. So now, the use of a frisk in a stop is legally justified as a means for recovering a weapons, recovering weapons, and to protect officer safety. And so we can estimate, based on all the available information, the risk to officer safety by observing how often weapons were recovered historically during frisks of similar individuals. So similar here means um, uh, people who are uh, uh, stopped in similar locations, under similar circumstances, similar times of day. And we say, okay, well, based on all the available information, what do we think the chance is that, uh, that, that um, the individual is carrying a weapon based on historical data? And now we're going to ask, are similarly risky individuals of different race groups frisked at different rates? And if so, that suggests an unjustified racial disparity in stop practices. Okay, so let's look at this by looking at, starting out by looking at white, um, white individuals who are, who are stopped and potentially subjected to a frisk. And here on the horizontal axis, we have the estimated risk rate. Um, uh, the estimated risk for each of these individuals, and on the vertical axis, we have um, the proportion who are actually frisked. So, for example, here we see that for people who have about a two and a half percent chance, estimated chance of carrying contraband, those who are white were frisked about fifty percent of the time. And if we now plot these similar curves, curves for both black and Hispanic drivers, we see that they lie above the curve for or for uh, for uh, uh, white um, uh, pedestrians. We see that Hispanic um, folks who are who are stopped who have the same estimated risk of two and a half percent are fr are frisked much more often, about sixty five percent of the time, and. Um, uh, and uh, uh, black individuals with the same estimated risk of two and a half percent of finding uh, finding a weapon are frisked even more often, about seventy five percent of the time. So again, here these are all individuals who have the same estimated risk of of uh, carrying a weapon. These are these are individuals that are are similar in that in that sense, but black and Hispanic individuals are frisked much more often than white individuals. So again, here 
But again, this is not only for this one um, estimate of two and a half percent, it holds across our entire population. So kind of regardless of that estimated risk, black and Hispanic individuals are frisked or subjected to this police frisk much more often than, than white individuals. So the takeaway is that um, the kind of the large statistical challenge here is assessing, assessing who is similar. Uh, and what we demonstrated is one approach that equates this this uh, this idea of similarity by measuring the likelihood that that individuals will be found to have a weapon at the same rate. This again was a stated goal for for conducting these frisks. And once we say look at this this population of similar individuals, when we see differences in that population, that is a notion that we that we associate with disparate impact. So even if that even if that difference is not driven by racial animus per se, it still has this unjustified disparate impact on, on racial minorities and is something that uh, ends up affecting the lives of hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of, of individuals over the course of this policy. So I'll end with that and, um, and, and open it up to a broader discussion for, for talking about all these different ways of conceptualizing um, uh, measuring and in some cases even mitigating the racial disparities. Yes, thank you. Um, we got uh, several questions on the chat and I want to start with uh, two questions on the first part, uh, the Veil of Darkness design. Um, <laughs> the first one is whether you are at all concerned about darkness having a direct effect on driving behavior that might differ by uh, race. If this is a consideration if you have any analysis on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and no, I can, I'll just add a second one, which asked for effective heterogeneity. So, so you, you showed us these uh, quite clear effects in the plots uh, on how the share of black drivers that are being stopped um, drops after sunset. And the question is whether you find this in all states and cities in the US or if you find different effects and if you have any ideas what could explain these uh, difference in effects, if there are any. Yeah, so both both good questions. Let me start with the first one. So this is a real concern. And actually, let me, before talking about this, this test and the analysis we've done in particular, let me talk about the broader measurement of discrimination. And so as was probably clear from much of this analysis, is there's very few definitive ways to say that some practice or some policy is discriminatory. You know, even defining what that means is hard, but even once we have, you know, a, a, a kind of definition like the, you know, the color of one's skin is, is causally affecting a change of behavior, it's very, very hard to definitively measure this. This is just sort of the nature of statistics. It's the nature of social sciences. It's not something that I think is 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 particularly surprising for this audience, but I think it is something that's useful to keep in mind. Is that we're never going to have that kind of clear, clear evidence that there's nothing else that's possible to explain what's going on. At the same time, we have kind of a, 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 a slate of methods now that we've been developing that I think get us much closer to ruling out other possibilities and helping us understand what's going on. And so in this particular case, I do think it's possible that darkness in and of itself is having an effect on, on policing behavior that is not due to the perception of race, but is, is really just having some outside effect. So what is one example of this? Let's say that officers are driving or stopping people with broken taillights, and broken taillights are only something that you're able to observe when it's dark outside. Right, so that could be an alternate explanation for what might be driving this type of pattern. Um, this example, though, actually would, would suggest something different. So broken taillights, um, we would we would think are more prevalent in in lower socioeconomic among lower socioeconomic drivers, which tends to be associated with race. And so, if that were actually the mechanism, we would we would expect to see a higher fraction of stop drivers to be black at night. In fact, we see lower. Um, fraction of stop drivers being black and night. And so again, this example was was simply to show that yes, there are there are ways where you know where darkness in and of itself the the could have an impact on officer behavior that is independent of of racism per se of discrimination per se. Um, 
Um, but also that particular example points in an opposite direction of what the empirical evidence uh, uh, suggests. And so it's harder to think of, of plausible ways that, that, that this pattern could emerge from a non kind of uh, racially discriminatory uh, policing practice, but it's certainly not impossible. And I think it's kind of keeping that caveat in mind is, is always useful for doing this type of analysis. Um, so now um, this this question of heterogeneity. So again, very kind of useful uh, uh, thing to understand. So one thing that that um, came out a lot of when we were doing this open policing project. And again, I said that we meant that we that we um, worked on this for seven years and and we're still going. And so this was quite a long project. You know, we probably committed you know about, you know conservatively estimate over 10,000 people hours to this work across our team. And at the end of the day, what do we find? We find, you know, in a sense, widespread discrimination. And, you know, some people kind of, you know, myself included, were like, well, you did all this work. And what is it, you know, you're not telling us anything new. Like this is something, at least in the United States, was kind of, I would say, but was something that people were really talking about for a for a long time. There are a lot of community groups, or a lot of a lot of people in affected communities who are raising these concerns, and and so what is it now? A bunch of researchers come in and say, oh, well, we're just like kind of corroborating everything that you're that you are saying. Um, and so, in some sense, this is like nice. We have this type of evidence, which was important for 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 policymakers, and hopefully was important for pushing this discussion forward. But at the same time, it wasn't, you know, in many ways, it wasn't telling us anything new. And so this is kind of a long way of getting to this question of heterogeneity for saying, well, what is one thing that I I personally kind of learned? Or what am I personal kind of, you know, um, uh, 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 I, I would say, you, you know, I was being naive about something that I that that relates to heterogeneity. Is that I live in San Francisco. This is kind of one of these, um, you know, uh, cities which likes to think of ourselves as as a relatively progressive place where we're like oh yeah there's lots of problems with discrimination in the united states but that's happening elsewhere that's not happening in san francisco that's not happening in california we're kind of enlightened and we kind of know how to kind of deal with this we just don't have these types of problems and one kind of the fact that we found from our data is the patterns that we're seeing were very sort of widespread spread across the country. And so if you look at San Francisco, if you look at all these other kind of cities across the country, we're seeing very kind of at a high level, we're seeing very similar patterns. Now, this comes with a caveat that when we get to kind of smaller geographic regions, it's harder to make precise estimates of what's going on. And particularly for the veil of darkness test, this is a type of analysis that requires a lot of data. Um, um, you know, and why is that? Because we're looking at small time windows. We're looking at these relatively small um, uh, 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 kind of time changes across daylight savings. And so once you slice it, it really requires a lot of stops to be able to measure these types of effects. And so these are noisier estimates all across the, when you when you hone in on, on smaller geographic regions. But at the same time, the broad pattern is one of, of widespread racial disparities, racial discrimination. And so again, this is something that a lot of people have been saying in the United States, but it's not one that 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 many scholars, including myself, really kind of fully internalized until we did this type of, of statistical analysis. Thank you. Thank you. We have, um, yeah, I would say one and a half question or two questions that I think apply to all the designs you presented. And that is the question like, um, whether the officers aren't only observing race, but also class, and how you think about this interaction between race and class, and if you are able to uh, control or explicitly model, model other social qualities uh, different than race, like um, income or like a middle class or working class look, um, if you incorporated these in the models at all. Yeah, so this is a really, really good question, and I think it's super important and kind of gives an opportunity to talk about this distinction between these two forms of discrimination that I that I mentioned here. On the one hand, disparate treatment. This was the type of discrimination that is exemplified by um, officers reacting to the color of one's skin, to one's perceived race. And this is the type of, of discrimination that we're trying to pick up in the veil of darkness test. And then the other form of disparate impact, 
which really is when we're talking about policies and practices that might have disparate burdens on particular groups, maybe in part driven by socioeconomics, not necessarily driven in part, not necessarily driven by racial animus, um, but still has a disparate burden on 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 certain racial groups in a way that is unjustified for furthering policy interests. Okay, so again, these are these kind of two concepts of, of discrimination that really come up all the time, not only in policing, but in, in many kind of broader contexts. So in the first, when we're trying to look at um, disparate treatment, whether or not you know one's perceived race is really causing differences in behavior, it's important to adjust for everything else. So it's important to adjust, for example, for socioeconomics. And that's exactly what this veil of darkness test is trying to do, is trying to say, well, we're just going to mask someone's race. You know, we're not going to change you know, the car that they're driving. We're just going to mask their race. We're not going to change where they're driving. All these other things is the same. We're just changing the ability for an officer to detect the race of the driver. And so this is really tuned into um, disparate treatment tuned into that form of discrimination. But now, if we look at these types of things that are happening in Nashville, in New York City, even in North Carolina, we're saying that there's this double standard um, applying, or there's just this policy of stopping many drivers. Let's say that this policy was even you know, totally race neutral in the sense that the officers were just stopping lots and lots of people um, for broken taillights. And you know, let's say there's totally race neutral in the sense that they weren't trying to target people based on the color of one skin. They're just deciding to make these types of stops. And now that practice clearly is driven in part, if you know, again, this kind of stylized version of that practice is driven in part by socioeconomics. Because if you have kind of an older car, if you have fewer means for, for fixing your broken taillights, then you're more likely to be stopped under that policy. There, we don't want to adjust for socioeconomics. We don't want to adjust for class because the point of that type of analysis of that type of argument is the practice itself of stopping drivers for broken taillights doesn't appear to have a, a public safety benefit. Again, that was a stated reason for the policy. It doesn't appear to have a public safety benefit, but it does have a disproportionate burden on minority drivers. And so they're adjusting for race, or sorry, adjusting for class would in fact wash away the effect in a way that doesn't let us measure the true um, uh, 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 disparate impact, this other form of discrimination, this form of systemic discrimination, which um, is being felt by minority drivers. Okay, thank you um, um, for this uh, interesting thoughts. I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, do we have data to rule out whether minority drivers are searched more after being stopped because they act more, I don't know, nervous, suspicious due to anticipating discrimination by police officers? Yeah, so it's a really good, um, it's, it's kind of a subtle question. We don't know what the mechanism is. And so in a sense, kind of there, what our test is picking up is statistically, is there a double standard? in the sense that, you know, based on all the available information, when a search is conducted, are you less likely to find contraband on, the, uh, on a black driver than on a white driver? So let me kind of tell you why this is, a, you know, going to why this is a subtle distinction and why this question is, I think, particularly um, insightful one. So, so, so let's say that, that black drivers um, are just more likely to, to be nervous you know, when they're stopped because of kind of historical discrimination. And let's say that officers in part are stopping drivers based on this, or are, are making the decision to search drivers in based, on, based in part on this kind of perception of nervousness. So now if that were the, and they were not adjusted now, if they were not considering race, they'd be like, oh, well, here's a driver who's nervous. Now let me, let me search for them. Let me search them. Now, over time, they might learn that when they search black drivers who are nervous, they find contraband less often. And so a perfectly rational officer would adjust for that in their mind. And they'd say, well, this black driver is nervous in part because they're in part because they like there's this like kind of larger structure of discrimination at play. And so I should downweight nervousness among black drivers relative to nervousness among white drivers. 
So if they do that, this is a way to kind of statistically um, ensure that you have a kind of that you're applying an equal standard, which is ultimately what officers are are you know kind of the efficient strategy for searching searching drivers. But it's a strategy which is also not race neutral in the sense that a driver's race is coming into that equation. And so this is kind of this, this difference between this first type of, of, of discrimination that we talked about, this veil of darkness style of uh, discrimination, where here the idea is decisions should not depend on one's race. And the second style of do we apply equal thresholds, where the threshold itself is defined in terms of, of, of the likelihood of finding contraband, in theory at least, could depend on one's race. So there's a little bit of tension here in, in whether or not we're willing to um, use one's race in order to make these types of decisions. Um, but I think it's, it's one that's, that's really highlighted in, in, this, in this example. So, I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, the limitations as well, you, you know, because you said, okay, I, we look at structural, uh, at statistical discrimination. Can, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? So what, uh, what do we need um, um, to, to analyze racialization and the quality of these treatments and so on? So what would you do to, to, to gain more insights um, about the processes and so on? Yeah, so I mean, again, it's a really good question. I don't. There's not like an easy answer in my mind. And so, kind of one. I mean, first of all, a lot of these methods that we've been been talking about, even this kind of conceptualization of of discrimination, is relatively recent. And so, this is something that's playing out in uh, you know, at least in the U.S. in the statistics community, something that's in the computer science community, something that we're kind of now um, um, starting to look at in depth. Um, even though this has kind of been an ongoing conversation for a long time, it's something that the empirical tools that I've been talking about um, are still relatively new. And so that's something that that I'm hoping there'll be much more attention to in the coming years and, and even decades is really a focus on these types of new empirical methods for disentangling and defining and combating um, discrimination. Now, that's kind of an open-ended sort of call to action of, of spending more time of developing these types of methods. Now, on the one bottleneck that we faced in, in one of the reasons I got involved in this work at the beginning is a, uh, is a big lack of data. And so uh, the United States, and I think this is where we're, you know, in some ways unique, um, is that it's, it's a very, very decentralized um, uh, system. And so every jurisdiction, you know, there's, there's no kind of federal repository of data on these types of interactions. There's in many cases, not even a state level repository of data. A lot of this is held at the city level or county level, um, which means that it's extremely hard to get data. This is why it took us so many years to collect this data is that it all comes in different forms. Um, uh, and, and there's kind of a diversity of policies that are playing out at, at every different level. And that has made it extremely hard to, to analyze what's going on. Um, and so that is that kind of uh, standardization and reporting guidelines is something that we've been pushing on a lot. We're starting to see traction. You know, California, for example, we're, we're the, the largest state in the country. We now have um, standards for police interactions that have to be reported annually to uh, up to the state level and then now all this is publicly available and so that makes it a, um, a lot easier to carry out this type of of analysis um so that's kind of one big bottleneck um that that i'm that i'm hoping will come in the years to come but now once you have data it's it's still a question of well, what data do you need yeah and again this is this is really um it's hard to answer because it depends on the type of analysis one's trying to do and so i in the very kind of a uh, crude sense, ideally you'd like to know all the circumstances in which a decision was made. Now the hard part is we almost always only have, have data on decisions that were made in the negative, or at least for many of these interactions. And so for example, um, we, we know data, we have data on people who are stopped. We don't usually have a lot of data on people who are not stopped. Um, and we only have detailed data on people who are searched. Um, or arrested, we don't really have a lot of detailed data on people for whom that decision was not made. And, and so this is this kind of funny trade-off that, that often our, our, our data are censored in a way that makes it hard to carry out 
this type of analysis, but not impossible, as, as the analysis I presented um, indicate. All right, we're getting even more questions. There are two short questions that I think I can answer briefly. Um, the first one is whether Datsun will be sharing the slides and where one could find the, the written reports of the work you presented. And I think this talk will be on YouTube to watch again and again, so you can look at the slides again. And um, I think your website would be uh, a great starting point to look for, for further work. Um, yeah. yeah, we have um, a lot of, so I kind of, in this work, I, I touched on maybe four or five different um, individual papers, but we have many, a lot of this is, is laid out on my website. So I encourage you all to look at it. And also I want to okay. give a plug for the Open Policing Project. We've released all of our data. And so we released at this point kind of 200 million stop records. All of that is publicly available. Um, we provide code for analyzing the data. Um, and so please check that out as well, openpolicing.stanford.ed. Thank you. So the next question is a bit more general. Um, I think in, in in the in the in the parts where you discussed uh, the decision to frisk and the the issue of inframarginality, in both cases you sort of had the idea, if I understood correctly, of a ground truth. So there there is sort of a ground truth of whether there was contraband in the car or whether the subject had a, had a weapon. And one question asked: um, Can we apply these tests to areas where this is? maybe not as clear. So let's think about hiring decisions. Yeah. So, or the healthcare system, how people are treated, where like the employability of a person or um, whether persons of good health or bad health might be not as obvious. Can we still apply these designs and tests in these areas? Yeah, so again, it's a really, really good question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the questioner really kind of honed in on one of the big limitations of that that style of work is that it fundamentally resulted on, or it, 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 it kind of rested on understanding what is good policy. And so here we have the benefit of knowing that when frisks were conducted, well, frisks by law and by policy are conducted when officers um, feel threatened for their safety. And so you can operationalize that by, by discovering a, a weapon ex post. If we don't have that, it becomes a whole lot harder to carry out this, this type of analysis. Um, uh, and I think hiring is a good example of this, where it's very unclear what you know, what a good employee means. Um, even if you look at something like, even something like, um, if you look at evaluations after the fact, now this, the worry is it's a biased measure in that people who end up receiving good recommendations, that itself might be um, driven in part by, by bias in the workplace. And so it's very hard to have kind of this clear measure of, of, uh, of what's going on there. Um, in the employment context, you, you people have done these types of audit studies that are very similar to the veil of darkness test, where you might send out a CV and, and then change the, the, the name of, of the applicant. So maybe indicating a different, different gender or a different race group. And then that can help us at least get to, to bias in that hiring decision or that callback decision for an interview. But it's a lot harder in these domains where we don't have a clear, um, a, a, a clear outcome um, that we care about. Nashville, I think, also provides um, kind of some middle ground here, that, that example, where it wasn't entirely clear what the, the outcome was, or kind of this broad sense of public safety measured by, by burglaries or, or measured by crime rate. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite as specific of like, you know, finding this, finding a weapon at the individual level, it's kind of broader pattern of public safety. And um, so I do think there is some middle ground here, which, you know, which, which helps us um, apply these methods in, in more contexts. Great, yeah, it's a tricky issue. And um, we, we have even more questions for sort of effect heterogeneity. I think how it applies to all um, designs. And there's a question whether you find any impact of the legal framework a police officer is working in. So does it matter what politicians uh, tell police officers uh, how to behave or how, how they allow them to behave? Or do you find differences there? And there's another similar question which asks, do you have any 
data on the race of the police officers who stop uh, the vehicles or, the, the, or are engaged in stop and frisk and whether that makes a difference. Yeah, so, so definitely there is a lot of heterogeneity in um, kind of the, the, the political uh, framing. There even, there's even some heterogeneity, although probably a little bit less in the legal framework. So again, we, we do have, you know, a lot of this is governed by, by federal laws, although there are um, state statutes which, which govern some of the context in which searches, for example, um, can be carried out. But in the political context, there's certainly quite a bit of, of heterogeneity. So I would say even more than the kind of that political context, there is the, the kind of police chief level of, of what officers are instructed to do. So for example, in Nashville, this was a very good example where um, they pretty much changed overnight. You know, within the course of a year or so, or so we saw about a 75 product, 75 percent reduction in the number of traffic stops that were going on. Now, that was all happening against this backdrop of political pressure, of, of pressure from community groups. Um, but all of that is is coming into play to dramatically changing the um, uh, uh, the, the, the stop practices in Nashville. We see very similar story in, in New York from a height of you know about half a million stop and frisks a year to almost nothing at this point. So very, very few stops on the order of maybe 10,000, 20,000 stops a year are, are happening. And again, this was driven by kind of combination of, of political pressure, a change in the police chief, um, uh, a court case that was that was ongoing at the time in, in, in New York. And so all of these forces come together to really have dramatic impact on, on policing practices. So now for the second, I think there was a second question on, on heterogeneity across uh, across race groups of the officer itself. So that's something that that I haven't looked at personally, although there is some work on on this. Um, and I think one kind of uh, kind of stylized fact is is that that many people are finding discriminatory behavior across race group of the the officer itself of themselves. And so it's not only the fact that that uh, white driver, white officers, for example, are discriminating, but this is kind of a phenomenon that that is is seen across officers of different race groups. Um, now, the I, I don't I, I I don't know that that um, kind of research intimately, so I don't want to overstate the results. There, and I do think there are some differences, but I think it's not the case that only only um, white drivers are or white officers are discriminating. Um, the other thing that that um, that I that I want to note is that when you have these kind of broad policies of, for example, kind of broadly carrying out you know stops for broken uh, you know uh, for broken taillights or, or or stop and frisk, that is a type of policy that again is going to have impacts across different race groups of officers because it is set at these higher higher institutional levels. And, and so while this heterogeneity I think is is important to understand, it also has limits for um, the downstream consequences. Thank you. We have uh, just um, one more question uh, about, do you also analyze the card types and models? And uh, if yes, can we draw a connection between car models and class? Is that mm -hmm. possible? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So we don't have any information on, on car types. Um, this is definitely something that I um, have been interested in to help with them to help understand what the mechanism is that's that's going on here. Um, and but I do want to note that that even if let's say that the car type is in some sense what is causally driving an officer decision, this still doesn't get at you, you know it doesn't it doesn't kind of excuse the disparate impacts of policies. And I think this is really I'm kind of I'm hammering home this point because I think it's one that that is is both kind of useful to understand the mechanisms, but I think also useful to understand that that discrimination extends beyond kind of the causal effect of perceived race on actions. And so it's useful to understand the the mechanism because that might help us you know uh, change officer behavior. If we say, oh, well, officers are responding to the make or the model of a car, and that has all these downstream disparate impacts, well, that helps us, gives us a tool for training officers to make decisions in a way that is, is broadly more equitable. But at the same time, even if that is the mechanism, we don't want to say, well, now it's not discrimination. 
now it's not racism because look, they're not, you know, they're not, you know, looking at someone's race, they're looking at the car type. And just because car type is correlated with race, then that is something we're not going to call racism. You know, this is a form of systemic discrimination, of institutional discrimination that I think is very, very important to understand, even if it is different than the type of animus-based discrimination that, that many of us are familiar with. I have another question um, regarding the research uh, we will be doing, hopefully be doing in the future here in Germany, and I sort of want to pick your brain there. Um, you already mentioned that it, the data that is collected in the US is not ideal. Um, the situation is less ideal in Germany. Although we have national registers, um, they only collect actual offenses. So we do not observe stops, but we basically only observe the, the hits. Um, and yeah, so very broadly, uh, my question would be, um, do you think that we can apply these methods to such data anyway? And more specifically, I think Rog and Ridgeway in their paper, they have this test for reporting bias. Um, and I wonder if, if we can sort of frame this movement from a stop to an actual offense also in terms of their reporting biases to say that if if this transition doesn't di differ with darkness and rays at the same time, then it's okay and we can still apply the test or whether there are other issues uh, to think about working with uh, such data. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so I, I think it depends on exactly what is being collected. And so, you know, if, if for example, the stops aren't being collected, but every time a search is conducted, that's what's being collected, regardless of what is found in the search, then I think that makes things a lot easier. I wasn't sure if when you say offense, does that mean literally only if someone is found with contraband, only if an arrest is made downstream, then that's the only time anything is recorded. That makes yeah. it that makes it a whole lot harder. Um, and it really it's it's nice to know something about the context in which decisions are made, not only when kind of positive decisions are 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 made. Uh, so it's hard. I'll, you know, we in our analysis, you know, in part for simplicity, but in part because we didn't quite know how to get around it, we we didn't analyze. We did have jurisdictions where we only had arrests, and we didn't analyze those jurisdictions. And and so we, you know, we 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 wanted to know the the negative cases as well, where where a search was conducted but nothing was found. Um. You know, there are other kind of benchmarks that one might try to, you know, even just kind of disparities. You know, this is something that I think is useful even just with the offenses. And so, for example, if you see a lot of people who are, um, uh, let's say, arrested for minor drug use, you know, that's something that, that comes up a lot in the United States. Um, you know, kind of that. And, and if you believe that there's not much of a connection between drug use and public safety, again, this is the movement that's happening in, in the United States. I'm not quite sure what the status of that discussion is in, in Germany and other parts of the country. But, you know, just the fact that you see this difference in the offense rate that already tells you that there could be an unjustified disparity. And so the mere fact that a higher number or higher per capita proportion of of individuals across race groups are being stopped or being charged with different offenses, that's already a useful kind of statistic to help drive drive policy. You know, another kind of example I'll give is that in some of our work, we're finding um, many people um, are being uh, charged with, with minor theft. And so this is something like shoplifting where the amount of the theft is, is something like $50. And this is, you know, disproportionately um, uh, has a burden on, on racial minorities. Um, sorry, can you hear? Is there someone cutting down a tree in my, in my backyard? I don't know if you can, if you can, if you can hear that. <laughs> but, 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 but hopefully hopefully you can still kind of hear what I'm saying. This is uh, one of the, It's all right. We're hearing you. <laughs> okay, okay. One of the, uh, the uh, um, downsides of, of, of uh, zooming into these types of things. But... Um, um, there, what we're what we're seeing is that you know the the policy has this disproportionate burden on on certain groups, which we're able to measure only looking at the offenses, 
And when kind of there's this belief that this isn't really something that should be happening as a course of policy, it gives us an avenue for updating, um, updating the prosecution of these offenses, even if we don't know there is you know, disparate treatment in this narrower sense that I spoke about at the beginning. Okay, so uh, I can't see more questions in the audience. So then I would say, um, yeah, then would like to thank you, uh, Shad Guell, for this uh, very, very interesting thoughts and um, that you share your thoughts with us. So um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, so the next confirmed talk will be on the 11th of, uh, 11th of October with, um, I think, one of the leading figures of the research of racism with John Solomos. So until then, uh, stay tuned and we wish you a good evening and see you. Thanks. Thanks again for the invitation. Uh, to participate in these important conversations. I really, really enjoyed spending this time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.